Good afternoon, everybody. I am Michael Waldman. I'm the president of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. And we are thrilled to have you join us for the first of two days of symposia on the critical issues of voting and representation, which we're very proud to be co-sponsoring with the NYU Law Review. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Brennan Center, we are a nonpartisan law and policy institute. We work as we see it to strengthen, to renew, to reform, and to defend the systems of democracy and justice in the United States. And there's no question that the system of democracy urgently needs repair at this moment, as is evident in so many ways to so many of us. We believe at the Brennan Center that we are all engaged in a great fight for the future of American democracy. Uh, this election year of 2020 was due to be extraordinary from the outset. We expected record turnout and the ongoing challenges of voter suppression and racially driven discrimination in voting, of cybersecurity issues, of our otherwise somewhat rickety system of running elections. And then of course, the extraordinary phenomenon, the public health tragedy, the economic tragedy of the pandemic and the impact that it would have and the risk that it would become not just an economic and health crisis, but a democracy crisis. We want to think anew to understand uh, how these issues, how these challenges uh, play out in the law, in constitutional terms, and in the ways that uh, our systems can be improved and reformed over the long run. And to that end, we have brought these experts, these practitioners, these leaders in the field together uh, for this really wonderful uh, conversation that will begin. Uh, we're going to be discussing today and a week from today, uh, how to run an election in a pandemic, what the future of voting is, how we can have a representative system amid tremendous demographic change that's remaking the face and the shape of the country. And uh, what kinds of structural and institutional barriers are there to having an election system that works the way we would want it to work? These are questions that are vital at any moment. They're urgently vital today at a time when we are a month from the election, when we have unprecedented controversy when we have the unprecedented phenomenon of misinformation about voting being shouted from the loudest megaphone in the country and more. There's much to discuss and we have tremendous people to do the thinking with us. We look forward to your questions as well. Uh, the Brennan Center, as I said, is a nonpartisan organization. We are a 501c3 uh, center. Uh, we do not support candidates, we do not take part in elections. Uh, and this conversation will reflect that. Um, we want to thank the partners who have put this event together with us. As I said, uh, the NYU Law Review, uh, a, a tremendous place where top-notch legal thinking and uh, passion for justice go hand in hand. The John Bradamus Center of NYU and NYU Votes, which provided information for students how you can participate. Um, I will mention also uh, of great excitement to uh, many of us, uh, for New York State lawyers, uh, you can get continuing legal education credit for watching and participating in this. During the sessions, uh, the code will, will pop up and you need to enter that to receive CLE credit. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. And even more exciting than CLE uh, is the leader who will be introducing uh, this, uh, this event. Uh, we are truly thrilled to have Stacey Abrams with us. Uh, Stacey Abrams, as you know, was the minority leader of the Georgia House of Representatives. She was the candidate for governor of Georgia in 2018, the first black woman to be a gubernatorial statewide candidate, uh, received more votes than any other Democrat in the state's history. She is, among other things, the author of the recent book, Our Time is Now, Power, Purpose, 
in the fight for a fair America. She is uh, the producer and, uh, and a driving force behind a wonderful documentary that Amazon has just released called All In, The Fight for Democracy. Uh, this is an issue, the issue of our elections, the issue of the health of our democracy that we believe has to be at the center of our politics, at the center of our public debate, at the heart of what we as Americans care about, talk about, push for, and fight for. It's an issue that touches so many people, but one of the things it has not had always is leadership, visible, public, politically savvy leadership that can have these issues raised at the highest level. Uh, so not just for joining us at this conference, but for the role she plays as the leader in the great fight for American democracy right now, we're really honored to introduce Stacey Abrams. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you to the Brennan Center, to NYU Law Review, NYU, and all of your sponsors. I want to brag for a second on Michael. He mentioned the uh, documentary All In. He has a cameo appearance, and he is an extraordinary voice in the documentary. And I have to thank the Brennan Center. Uh, much of the research that I did for my book really relied on the extraordinary work that's been done by the Brennan Center for so many years as they work tirelessly to shore up our democracy, but more importantly, to articulate what it is and what it can be. And one of the reasons I was excited to join you all today is because that's what this conversation is about. It may be framed around this election cycle and framed around COVID-19, but fundamentally it's about how do we preserve the idea of democracy in a nation that is undergoing dramatic changes. We sit in a moment of economic crisis, of healthcare catastrophe, of racial reckoning, and each of those is putting into sharp relief the underpinnings of how we govern ourselves, how we navigate challenges, how we seek to resolve the tensions that have been such a part of our nation from its inception. And at the core of that is the question of what does a democracy look like in the 21st century in the United States of America? And unfortunately, I do not come to you with great news. Uh, my experience with voter suppression in 2018, while it was singular in the sense of the dynamics, we were you know, in essentially a, a made-for-TV movie where my opponent was the Secretary of State and I'm you know, running for office in this you know, historical way. But fundamentally, it's a conversation about America. While that election may have put this conversation into the fore of our narrative about democracy, I come at this knowing that this is not a new story, that voter suppression has been a part of American life since our inception. We have always been a nation that has struggled with our highest ideals and with the you know, pedantic nature of what we think we can be and how willing we are to work towards it. But voter suppression has shaped itself in different ways over the last 243 years, but its architecture has always remained the same. And it's fairly simple. One, can you register and stay on the rolls? Two, can you cast a ballot? And three, does that ballot get counted? And whether you're talking about the inception of our nation where only white men who owned property were permitted to register and to cast their ballots, where African-Americans, where Blacks were told that we weren't quite human. Native Americans were erased from citizenship and women were told to be silent. Fast forward to Reconstruction and the 15th Amendment, fast forward again to the 1965 Voting Rights Act. We find ourselves in the 21st century relitigating and finding anew the ways that voter suppression manifests itself in our country. I wrote a book about it. I produced a movie about it. I'm here to talk to you today about it because I believe that we can do something about it. I do not believe in the permanence of voter suppression. I believe that until we name our enemy and shape our work to address that enemy, we will be doomed to repeat these cycles of torpor, these cycles of erosion that cause us to worry about whether our democracy can hold. But I know it can if we're willing to work at it. Because I know that in the 21st century, the question of can we register and stay on the rolls has a very different narrative than it did at the beginning of our country. Because today we're talking about what is happening in Florida when 65% of Floridians said, 
give the right to vote back to returning citizens, and yet the legislature and the governor have once again stripped them of that right. We talk about the things that we deal with in the state of Georgia, although we've mitigated the harm of exact match, that barrier to being able to register to vote remains very real. And across this country, we have to grapple with who we decide can access the point of entry, which is registration, and the corollary, who gets to stay on the rolls. Nine states that permit states to remove people from the rolls by law and 44 states in total that do it by practice. We know that we are facing a conversation of who can stay on the rolls in the midst of massive displacement caused by COVID-19, where people who may want to still be heard may not be there to get the postcard that tells them that they're losing their right to vote. And so we have to grapple with what it means to register and stay on the rolls in the United States in the 21st century. And the conversation about casting a ballot is a conversation that has been amplified by misinformation because that's exactly what the conversation regarding absentee ballots, vote by mail is about. Who gets to cast a ballot and how? And we know in a time where we are losing poll workers because of their very real threat, face the, the very real threat they face from COVID-19, when we know that polling places shutting down diminishes the likelihood of people being able to cast their votes, vote by mail is a necessary response. And on the plus side, we have seen progress. In January of 2020, only 34 states allowed you to vote by mail with no excuses. We're now up to 41 states with no excuses and an additional four states that will let you use COVID-19 as an excuse. But that still means we do not have universal access for everyone who should be protected and have this ability to vote by mail. But we are still also in the courts grappling with who gets to use it. And we have a tension between whether we should expand access to include every single person who's eligible to vote or whether we should limit access because of the specter of voter fraud, which is not real. And then there's a question of whose votes count. And we have seen that in the primaries, half a million absentee ballots were thrown out. And thus we see litigation across the country trying to ensure that when a person in good faith registers, casts the ballot, that their ballot be counted. As we head into this election season in full throttle, I know this conversation is going to continue during the symposium, but I wanted to lift up the architecture because it's important to know what we're facing if we know, if we want to know how we navigate it. And what I will tell you is that the navigation of these issues is actually much better than it's been in recent years. Through litigation, through legislation, through the executive power of many governors, we are starting to see protections come into play in this election cycle. Protections for voters who did not know that they had to have a secrecy envelope and a regular envelope and that their signature had to match a piece of paper they signed 20 years ago. We are starting to see opportunities to cure, opportunities to ask, opportunities to expand the methods of voting. And that is a good thing. That is a righteous thing in a democracy that people be able to meet their, their leaders at the ballot box and make their choices. But we know that that leadership and that expansion is being met with threats, with intimidation, and with equal, equally divisive legislation and litigation to limit who can participate. But what comes next is why I'm here. We are going to survive this election because first and foremost, we are not going to panic. We are going to learn, we are going to immerse ourselves in election law, and we are gonna immerse ourselves in the fundamental question of who deserves to be heard in America. And I believe that an eligible citizen should be heard. And so if we know that, we cannot allow ourselves to panic based on all of the terrible information that we're going to hear. I live in a state where nearly every week we hear of a new issue regarding voting. But I will tell you this, if we are persistent, we can get through this. And so my first admonition is do not panic. Second admonition, of course, is make a plan to vote early. We know that in the 21st century, rather than guns and dogs and billy clubs, what we see in voter suppression are administrative rules and bureaucratic barriers and lack of information or worse, misinformation. And if we make a plan to vote early, we can navigate each of those challenges. We cannot mitigate them all, but we can mitigate a great deal of them. So if we make a plan to vote early, using the fact that in 45 states, you can vote by mail with no excuse or with COVID as an excuse. So let's do that. Knowing that in 41 states, you can vote early in person. 
and knowing that every single person in America who's eligible to vote should be able to vote on election day, assuming their polling places are open. But regardless of which one you choose, the mission is to choose early, to make a plan, then have a backup plan, then have a backup to your backup plan. And I come to this as someone who had to make a backup plan and a backup backup plan, and I was able to do it, facing voter suppression during the primaries here in Georgia. But if we do this work, if we don't panic, if we make a plan, and then third, if we share our plan and encourage others, we will actually have an election that is reflective of our needs and of our values. We know that when people are called to speak for themselves and speak for their families, they usually answer the charge. They will show up. And so we need to be the ones encouraging them through our own behavior, through talking not about the reasons to worry, but the reasons to be determined, the ways we can get this done. Because as we go into 2021, the decisions that will be made about recovery from COVID-19 and recovery from what has been, unfortunately, a deep rescission and retreat from, act from access to democratic values is going to be more critical than ever. We need to expand access to all three methods of voting, voting by mail, in-person voting, and voting on election day. We need to ensure that we restore the Voting Rights Act so that we no longer see the erosion of polling places and communities that have no alternatives. We need to have automatic voter registration in the United States and join the rest of the democratized, industrialized world in being smart about how registration happens. And we need to allow same day registration so that anyone who moves doesn't have to learn the electoral laws of a new state before they put down a, de a deposit on an apartment. We need to take the lead. And I'm excited about the symposium because this is not simply about how we recover from a pandemic. It's how we prepare for the next crisis and the crisis after that. Because democracy exists so that we have the fortitude and the wherewithal to meet the challenges of the moment together. We may not all have the same mission, but we all come from the same place. And that is the United States that should be grounded in justice for all, grounded in access for all, grounded in a commitment to the democracy that has made us as strong as we are. We are not yet a perfect union, but we can continue to strive for it, but only if we do so by protecting, defending, and fighting for our democracy. And so I thank you all for being here. I encourage you to listen and learn and to do all you can to ensure that people around the country make a plan to vote and make a change possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stacey Abrams. That was uh, wonderful. And uh, I fear that much of what will follow in the next two days will be uh, depressing and menacing. And it was uh, extraordinary, and I have to say unexpected, to have such a note of optimism and such an awareness of the uh, progress that we have made grudgingly in being able to overcome so many of these obstacles. Uh, I thought that was uh, truly inspiring. Um, I'm, I'm Sam Zakharoff. I uh, teach at NYU Law School. I'm the Reese Professor of Constitutional Law. Um, this is a panel that's entitled Pandemic Politics, and it's really a discussion about uh, the perfect storm that we're encountering at that present, or uh, to use the vernacular that was coined on CNN the other night about the presidential debate about the shit storm we face right now. And I want to put on the table five things that are coming together that are the challenges that I'm going to ask our panelists uh, to address. The first, obviously, is the pandemic itself. And we have had experiences with the difficulty in being able to vote for reasons having to do with the circumstances of the times before. We had the 1918 pandemic. We've had wars. Uh, we've had uh, mechanical difficulties in just getting the franchise done. And the second point and related is that when we have these challenges, it exposes the weakness of our administrative capabilities in elections. And we see that sometimes quite apart from partisanship. We saw it in the New York congressional race. We saw it in the absentee uh, ballot fiasco in Brooklyn right now. Uh, the third point is that voting itself has become 
a uh, a a challenge. There is a uh, a question about the integrity of voting. There is um, a direct assault upon voting in a way the capacity of citizens to vote. And I think that Stacey Abrams spoke quite well about this in a way that we really haven't seen in about 30 years. And uh, this is a change in the times. The fourth is that the franchise itself has become part of the question of polarization of politics. And we really haven't seen this in the United States in a very long time where the uh, ability to vote has become an organizing mechanism of contested politics. Uh, in some ways, not since the, the post-reconstruction effort to disenfranchise African-Americans have we seen such concerted uses of state authority uh, and polarized politics on the franchise itself. And the fifth, and I, I'm sorry to introduce this, but we've not had a president who has uh, set about to assault the integrity of the voting process before or not in a very long time. And uh, that has added to the disruptive elements. So let me uh, turn to uh, our panel. And uh, this is uh, an extraordinary group. Uh, and I will do very little by way of introduction. Uh, Mirna Perez is the director of the voting rights uh, activity at the Brennan Center. I'm proud to uh, claim her as a former student of mine. Uh, professor Bernard Fraga is a uh, professor of political science at Emory. Uh, professor Rabia Belt is a professor of law at Stanford Law School. And finally, uh, Dale Ho is the director of the ACLU Voting Rights Project, which has been as active as anyone in litigating uh, ballot access and other such issues. Um, before jumping in, uh, we would love to have questions from you. You can tweet uh, at the hashtag, uh, hashtag Brennan Live, uh, or you can do the same on YouTube or Facebook streaming. And as Michael Waldman said, uh, for CLE credit, we will flash things every few minutes uh, on uh, how you do that. Um, I'm going to take them out of order because one of the uh, downsides of having a, a great litigator on the panel uh, like Dale is that he has other commands on his time and things come up. And so the question I'm going to pose to each of you, and let me start with Dale, and then we'll just go in order from that, is um, what is it that keeps you up at night? If you accept my colloquialism that we face a potential shitstorm, um, and uh, I'm so proud of being able to say that publicly, so I'm going to keep saying it. Um, what, what do you, what's your nightmare scenario? What's the top three things that keep you up at night worrying right now? Uh, thanks for that question, Sam, and thank you all um, for joining us today. It's a real privilege to be on this distinguished panel. Um, uh, it, it seems like uh, it's hard to narrow it down to three things. It seems like it's a different thing every night, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, the first is that we will see a repeat of the kinds of problems that we saw during the primaries, but in many places simultaneously and much worse um, than we saw, um, than we experienced even then. Um, this election poses perhaps the greatest election administration challenge that this country has faced since the 1864 presidential election was conducted during the Civil War. Um, we're having massive um, shortages of poll workers. Most poll workers in federal elections are over the age of 60. You can understand why a lot of those folks are going to be unwilling to volunteer themselves to sit for 12 hours in crowded indoor locations dealing with hundreds of people. Um, a lot of locations that are normally used for polling sites um, are not open to the public or at least not the public at large. Um, schools, um, churches, senior centers and the like. Um, those two things mean that we will probably have more, uh, we will probably have fewer polling locations than we did in 2016 overall. Um, combine that with the fact that the electorate grows every year simply by virtue of population um, growth, and we will have more voters assigned per polling location, perhaps in an, any election in American history. Um, the result during the primary was um, 
long lines in places like Milwaukee, three hours or more. Outside of Atlanta, five hours, or Las Vegas, um, seven hours or more. And because of the higher number of people seeking to vote on election day, um, we can expect the possibility anyway that we will see those kinds of problems um, magnified um, and in many different places across the country. It's thus absolutely critical that we try to flatten the curve, so to speak, um, take the pressure off of elections administrators and get people voting um, as early as possible. Um, we've done our part at the ACLU by bringing um, over two dozen cases to try to facilitate modes of voting other than on election day in person. We focus primarily on lawsuits to expand eligibility to vote by mail. Five states whom we have litigated against have are among those that um, Stacey Abrams mentioned that have changed their rules to permit all voters to vote by mail during the pandemic. A number of other states have expanded eligibility to do so in response to our litigation. And we've also challenged laws that make it harder for people to vote by mail or break social distancing protocols. Things like witness signature requirements, um, outdated requirements that don't really do anything for election integrity um, that about a dozen states have requiring people voting by mail to have someone witness them actually complete their absentee ballot and then sign their absentee ballot envelope um, in order to have that vote counted. Um, we've litigated that issue in um, half a dozen states and obtained fa favorable rulings um, in four. Um, so we're doing our part. Hopefully we will not have a massive crunch on election day, but it's possible um, that we will, um, all during the worst public health crisis that this country has seen in a century. That's one thing. <laughs> Another thing, the second thing that keeps me up at night is the possibility that we will see problems like voter intimidation. Um, some, that, that's something that happens on every election, um, but worse. Um, we have a president who just recently in the debate appeared to encourage white supremacists and other private actors to go to the polls and be disruptive presences on election day. That could obviously um, be a recipe for significant problems, especially in light of the civil unrest that the country has experienced over the last six months in places like Kenosha. Um, I don't want to alarm people. Um, we have no reason to believe at this point in any specific place that there are going to be, say, violent incidents that result in polling place closures or other kinds of disruptions at polling places. Um, but I know that we at the ACLU anyway are preparing for a range of scenarios um, that is um, broader and perhaps more extreme than what we have prepared for in the past, um, just in an abundance of caution. Um, and then a third thing that we're worried about um, that keeps me up at night um, is the possibility that there could be confusion um, about the state of the election on election night that mm -hmm. um, some people try to take advantage of to sow doubt in um, the American public's confidence in the integrity of the process and even efforts to halt the count, the full canvas of ballots. Um, everyone knows this election is different. Um, one of the main reasons for that is the sheer number of absentee ballots that are being cast. Um, those ballots typically take longer to be counted than votes cast in person. And some states, including um, what are regarded as the tipping point states from the 2016 election, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, do not permit the processing of absentee ballots, let alone the actual tabulation of them, until um, the day before the uh, election in Michigan's case, um, or until after polls close in the case of Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. That would mean that we're not going to get necessarily the kind of instant gratification that the American public has gotten used to on election night, mm -hmm. where the minute that polls close, you have breaking news graphics on CNN or Fox News um, with projected winners of individual states. It could be the case that we have only as many as 40 or 50 or 60 percent of the outstanding ballots counted in some states on election night. That's not a reason to be alarmed. That's how the process is supposed to work this year. But it's possible that some could use that fact to sow confusion. Um, the president himself has um, done his best to undermine confidence in the mail-in voting system, which he himself um, regularly uses, as, as do members of his family, his cabinet, and other members of his administration. 
it's possible we're in a situation where he's leading the in-person vote on election day, given partisan differences um, that have been um, um, discovered in public opinion polling about intended vote choice in this election. He could be leading in some swing states on the in-person vote totals on election night. And with something like 40 to 60% of the ballots still uncounted, the absentee count um, not yet accounted for, he could simply declare himself um, the winner, um, cause a lot of confusion, perhaps even um, um, undermine confidence in the election or even attempt to stop the full canvas of ballots. And that would take us into uncharted uh, territory, both um, as, a, as a political matter and as a legal one. Uh, Dale, we're going to lose you. So uh, let me ask one follow-up question because I'm not sure you'll be around after uh, everybody, if we go through everybody. Um, there's, a, there's a tension in the advocacy position. Uh, early on, it was aimed primarily at opening up absentee voting and voting by mail in various forms. Uh, and given the political attacks at present, I think that for people who can, everyone should be encouraged to vote on election day or in some kind of early voting, putting the ballot in the urns or actually going as in Virginia has opened already for uh, uh, early voting, all just in the normal mechanism. Um, is it time to really uh, advise people that given the political uh, uncertainty and legal uncertainty of post-election uh, potential challenges. If they can, please do vote in person, either on election day or before, if your state permits it. Well, 41 states, as Stacey Abrams noted, do permit early in-person voting. So that's a good thing. It's available to the vast majority of Americans. And I think, you know, there's nothing I think wrong with suggesting that that might be the best way for a lot of people to vote in this election. I do wanna just be careful about, um, you know, making people distrustful about the mail-in voting process. This is something that's been with us since the Civil War and which 34 states, even before the pandemic began, were permitting every eligible voter to do. And the problem that I identified of late tabulation of absentee ballots, that's a problem that is of particular concern in only about a dozen states. Um, when you talk about the battleground states in particular, if that's what you're worried about, it's even fewer. Um, states that just don't permit the processing of those absentee ballots until either election day or election night. A number of states um, actually process those ballots. Right, like Florida. Basis. Right, um, some some number of days before the election, Florida, for example, is yeah. one of those states. So, you know, I, I I don't think people need to say be fearful of the absentee process if that's the one that works best for their life circumstances. Um, but but I don't disagree with your suggestion either that in many places, if you can vote early in person, that might be the best option. Right, it's the political uncertainty of the times that, and the post-election uh, legal uncertainties that follow that are, I think, problematic. So, uh, Mirna, um, what's your uh, nightmare scenario? Do you, do you share Dale's view that it's primarily, uh, he picked uh, the mechanics of the voting, uh, the uh, voter intimidation, and the uncertainty of the legal environment post-election? What, what's your uh, top set of concerns? Well, it's it's funny because Dale and I uh, work alike and think alike in a lot of ways, but I make a big distinction between the things that keep me busy during the day and the things that keep me awake at night. The things that keep me busy during the day are definitely the things like white supremacists at the polls, uh, people out of paper or not knowing how to use the machine or closing a polling place without any notice, uh, but, uh, poll workers not showing up and voters not getting the kind of service that they need, people processing ballot, not processing ballots on time, people not being confused about all the changes. What keeps me up at night is a bit more transcendent. It's, it's more things like I am worried that we're going to have turnout depressed because of all the gloom and doom and concerns 
that folks have about the bumps in the road, which I think are going to be significant. I think we are going to have some hiccups on Election Day. I think we do, even in the best of circumstances. It is unrealistic to assume that Election Day is going to go smoothly when even in when we aren't in the middle of a once in a generation pandemic, there are you know some pretty significant issues with lines and polling places not being open and people misapplying the law. Um, but uh, I think in this environment, we're seeing concerns being nationalized. Like I can't tell you how many times I am on a radio show and somebody calls in and says, hey, I'm really worried that my signature on my vote by mail ballot is not gonna get counted. And they live in a state that actually doesn't do signature matching. Um, we have somehow gone from trying to prepare and troubleshoot into the uh, environment of scaring people. Um, and I think a little bit of fear if that makes people prepared and ready and resilient, I think is probably healthy. But I don't want people staying home because they've heard about challenges that are happening in another state. I also don't want people staying at home because they think that a barrier in one state is going to apply to them when they don't. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to be in the business where those of us who are spending so much time and so much energy and having some real successes in making the voting environment better for everybody um, are actually un undermining the work that we're doing because we've let people know uh, there's a problem we need to fix and we haven't yet explained how much progress that has been made. I mean, when we think about how much advancement the states have seen since the pandemic was declared, I think we should all just be impressed with um, our advocacy and the people's like demand for uh, for good, uh, good and pro-voter election services. I mean, one thing to think about is exactly what Dale said about how many states uh, you know, about 34 didn't let everybody vote by mail prior to the pandemic. And now we're about five that are going to limit um, everybody who at least doesn't have a COVID concern and maybe limit nobody. Right. So like we we're really making a, a bunch of changes. Like right now, almost half the states are going to be providing postage um, for their mail ballots when they didn't. Um, so uh, so I guess my, my concern, number one, again, is that we are going to be doing the work of the vote suppressors by trying to explain how urgent it is that we fix the problem. And we're not actually explaining to Americans that there are things we can do. There are things that you can do. Um, and if you run into a problem, call one of us. We'll file a lawsuit. We'll talk you through it. We'll help you. Like um, we're, we're gonna be in a position where we're going to be able to solve the vast majority of problems that we see on election day. And I don't want people staying at home because they're worried about that. Um, my second sort of transcendent thing that is keeping me up at night is that uh, we're all over relying on the courts. And I know that this may be uh, uh, out of favor for a, a litigator, for someone who files as many lawsuits as I do, for someone who loves being in court um, and winning. Um, but I, I think we have to remember that uh, that we are in a place where I think it's really important to be going after hearts and minds right now where uh, things that seemed bedrock, like the idea of a free, fair, and accessible ballot are being challenged by very uh, well-placed megaphones. And those well-placed megaphones are having are taking uh, hold in more places than I think we would like to admit. Um, and that by going to the courts, we are one, forgetting that the composition of the courts um, may not be the friendliest um, forum for getting pro-voter election reforms, that the composite that court actions take a long period of time and they take a really long time to get resolved and it's very hard to say that there's final um that when things are decided by the courts the people don't always understand what the policies are because things are going like this and back and forth and you win one and then you lose at the appellate level and the like um and that um we have like big court battles coming ahead of us like whether or not section two of the voting rights act is um still good law and constitutional and whether or not a new and uh, a new and improved voting rights act uh you know if it gets passed is constitutional um i think we need to be in the business of making sure that we are still um selling the idea of democracy right that we're selling the value of a democratic system that includes all of us 
um, and that we are explaining that our democracy works best when it when it hears from all of us, especially now when our institutions are facing a real um, concern over legitimacy because of things that this country has done and things that this country has left undone um, that mean that many of our institutions of power don't reflect or represent us um, as much as we would like or hope or our ideals dictate. Um, and the third sort of transcendent concern um, is the idea that there are going to be no limits to the political hardball. There are no norms. There are no um, things that are off the table when people are trying to translate uh, votes to political victories. And I, and I want to give one of the examples of, um, of Florida. Uh, Stacey Abrams mentioned this. Uh, a, a number of us worked really, really, really hard to get Amendment 4 passed in Florida, which was a historic uh, piece of uh, constitutional change in Florida that, permanent, that ended the permanent disenfranchisement system. Um, had it been uh, accepted the way the people intended, we could expect that upwards of a million people would have gotten their rights to vote back. Um, and then what did the legislature go and do? Legislatively change the definition of sentence, right? Um, and I think we can see this kind of what some people call political hardball in a bunch of different circumstances, where whether people are talking about um, the entrenchment of the courts or people are talking about like uh, certain constitutional changes that they want to see or different ways, again, in Florida where they're trying to, uh, where they've made changes to how you actually change the constitution. Um, and I, I wonder what that's going to leave us with. Um, if we don't have any shared upon norms, when there's not a basic understanding that winning at all costs um, is not good for us, um, that we want to leave our children, irrespective of our political beliefs, we want to leave our children a country, a democracy, a way of resolving our political differences peacefully, a system that people can say, even if I lose um, this particular candidate, I still or my, uh, this particular race or my candidate didn't win, that I still feel okay enough about the system to be invested in being a contributor to this country and, um, and being uh, a, a, a person who participates in civics and a person who is pro-social and does things for their country and their community and their neighbors. Um, and I, I'm seeing a just a real degradation of like norms and a shared understanding that there are some things more important than winning a particular political race. And, and uh, you know, as someone who believes in the country and believes in the institution and believes in our constitution, I worry about what do we do when we say that some things matter more than just the outcome of one particular race. And I'm seeing some folks that don't seem to have that view and and it makes it makes things challenging. So I, I'm sorry for being more abstract. I mean, we are in all of the fights that Dale is doing, but again, I feel like the nuts and bolts stuff, we're gonna fix most of those because we're all working really, really hard during the day. It's the it's the stuff at night that I that I think are are harder to to to, to untangle. That's a that was a very useful distinction because it ties back into the way Stacey Abrams began with focusing on the progress that has been made, including in the last six months in response to the COVID environment. Uh, Bernard, uh, uh, let me ask you the same question, but let me focus it just a little bit more because you're a real specialist on turnout and the and uh, who participates in democratic politics, who votes, et cetera. Um, in light of the perfect storm type environment, whether it's COVID or whether it's the other, uh, the other features. What are your concerns with regard to voting and the participation itself? Sure. So, well, thank you very much for having me and for you know hearing my thoughts on these concerns. What keeps me up at night? I'm coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia, which, according to recent polls, is you know the most competitive state in the nation for the presidential election, and has not only one, not only two, but three competitive statewide federal elections this November with the two Senate races, including the Senate special election. So uh, that's three things that keep me up at night for sure. But, you know, in addition to that, uh, you know, the first thing that, that I really think a lot about kind of blends Mirna's first two points, which is the preponderance of relatively devious forms of intimidation and deterrence that really aren't gonna be effectively dealt with through the legal system. 
So obviously, when we think about you know obvious voter intimidation, what we heard in the debate on Tuesday, you know Trump's comment about poll watchers, what we saw in Fairfax, Virginia, with people disrupting an early voting site, and you know lawyers for the Trump campaign saying they want fifty thousand volunteers to watch the polls. You know these are concerns, but I I have faith in my colleagues and my my lawyer colleagues. They'll be able to prosecute and deal with those issues. You know for uh, the, the second kind of set of these voter intimidation deterrents, things that I think we might be able to deal with are the election laws and processes that you know keep people from voting, make it more difficult to vote. You know, ID laws, purges. You know, we have techniques for for dealing with that. At least I hope so. But you know, this this more kind of again devious uh, forms of deterrence that we've seen come to the fore. The context of the pandemic and this contested election, things like the threats to mail-in voting. Uh, changes in USPS practices that have really had the effect of telling voters, you might try and vote, but your vote might not count. You should not trust your election officials. As Mina said, I think that's going to have a really negative impact on voter turnout, disproportionate impact on racial and ethnic minority groups in particular that we know are key to this election and key to ensuring we have a more representative democracy. Right, so a recent poll from August found that two thirds of black Georgians, for example, did not trust that if they cast their ballot by mail, it would be counted fairly by state election officials. There's a lot of work there for campaigns to do, but a lot of work for advocates to do as well to make sure that voters know that voting by mail is secure, but also to know that if there is a problem, we will be able to step in and solve that issue. The second thing that keeps me up is the fact related to voter turnout that there's a lot of shifts happening right now, changes happening in the way people are planning to vote, the way they're going to vote now versus the way they would have voted without the pandemic. So we know that voting itself, the decision to vote is habitual. If you vote in the past, you're much more likely to vote in the future. But the method you vote is also habitual in many ways. And counties and states are just now deciding and advertising the options that would be available to voters, where they're gonna be able to vote early, what their polling places are, a lot of confusion. We saw some of that with the special election here in Atlanta in District 5, John Lewis's old district, right? Polling place was closed, it was locked, voters showed up. Apparently they weren't even supposed to vote that day, but all of these changes and confusion really might be a perfect storm for keeping voters from voting because they're just not used to voting in the method they have to vote in now because of the pandemic. So this is not just about individual capacity, but also institutional capacity to advertise and make sure everybody knows how to form a plan to vote and can follow that plan on election day or before election day. The third thing that keeps me up, strangely enough, ironically perhaps, is fatigue, is people being tired. Stacey Abrams said, you know, we're gonna survive this election. We all have to persevere and get through it, but we're tired, frankly. And our election administrators are tired as well. And my fear is that that fatigue will lead to failures on election day, not because of intentional suppression or efforts to change who votes and who shows up, but simply because election officials are overworked, not just poll workers, but our board of elections, the people who are in charge of these processes. And if they're tired, it might lead to longer lines on election day. It might lead to them not being able to deal with election machine failures or other issues that might pop up. It might lead to them not planning efficiently for what will likely be very high turnout, even on election day, even with all the efforts that have been made to get people to vote early or vote by mail. So I'm scared of that happening. I'm scared of people being tired and just not doing the work that they know they need to do in order to ensure that everyone can cast a ballot effectively. Now- That's a great, that's a great point because um, it, we're in such a polarized, hyper-politicized environment that there's a tendency to see human agency mm -hmm. and conspiracy in everything that goes wrong. And it's nice to bring it back to the fact that it's a really imperfect system under tremendous stress. Let me let me jump to Rabia because uh, we're I, I haven't managed the time well. But so Rabia, what uh, what are you concerned about? And in particular, I know you have. Uh, you're very attentive to how disadvantaged communities, people uh, with disabilities uh, are confronted by pandemic issues. What, what's the issues that you see as of primary concern right now? So thank you, Sam, and thank you to the Brennan Center and NYU Law Review for organizing this important event. And 
Thank you to Stacey Abrams for her inspiring and informative keynote speech. So as a disability law professor, this election is particularly striking because we're seeing what modifications we have to take for the election due to the vulnerabilities of our bodies to COVID-19. And thinking about physical vulnerability is something that the disability community thinks about in general. It's a long-standing concern with elections. And this pandemic is forcing us to rethink a lot of the electoral practices we've taken for granted. It provides opportunities for new investments and accommodations that may help voters, including disabled voters, but I'm still concerned. And I would certainly say that I'm concerned about all of the issues that keep the other panelists up at night. But um, for people with disabilities in particular, they're not in the crosshairs of these voter suppression efforts that have been discussed, but they can be collateral damage, both in terms of how they're negatively impacted by activities designed to suppress turnout, and also because their needs for accessibility aren't adequately addressed. Um, and this is a large number of folks. So uh, nearly 40 million eligible voters have disabilities. And this exceeds the total number of eligible voters who are Black or Latino. Um, and I also want to sort of emphasize there's a significant overlap with people who are both disabled and racial minorities. Um, and the South has the highest number of disabled people and the rate of disability, and as we know, has had historically problematic voting practices. So just to uh, put some things on the table briefly, one is uh, overlapping concerns about COVID vulnerability due to race and pre-existing conditions. And there's been roadblocks for folks worried about COVID-19 transmission being able to obtain mail-in ballots. Luckily, as the panelists have said, that this has been sort of an active area for lawsuits to allow people to um, receive mail-in ballots, but those ballots aren't always accessible for people. So for people who have print-related disabilities, such as blindness, for example, um, they need to have a different type of ballot. And it can also be difficult to access information on state websites to receive an accessible ballot. So for instance, Disability Rights Idaho has um, written to the Idaho State Legislature about the inaccessibility of their website. Or there could be roadblocks besides the ballot itself, such as signature issues, which particularly hit folks with disabilities, especially as impairments progress. And then the third thing could be accessibility for voting for folks who live in congregate care settings or group homes. They can have reduced personnel because of COVID-19, so they may have trouble to get the help they need to get a ballot and mail it in. They may not be able to go to an in-person polling site or to a drop-off site. And I also want to emphasize issues for folks who have been released from spaces like carceral institutions due to the pandemic. Um, so there may be delays in processing their arrangements, uh, such as updating their residence, um, ID requirements, and they may not know how to obtain a ballot or if they're eligible for one. And we find many folks with uh, disabilities that have been in carceral spaces, and they're also the folks that have been released from carceral spaces because of their physical vulnerabilities. So, and they are, uh, community that may have a lot of trouble voting for this upcoming election. So uh, let me put a question to all of you and you can take it up in, in the way you want. Um, what I'm hearing from you is that there's a strange convergence between uh, actions that are taken to actually suppress the, the, the vote in, in some malevolent way. And that's part of our political discourse but that most of the problems you've identified are ones of making the system, an imperfect system work under conditions of extreme stress. So here's the question, to what extent do the tools that help us address things like voter suppression, uh, ill-motivated voter ID laws and so forth, now carry over to give us protections in the COVID environment, to, you know, to what uh, to what extent do we have a paradoxical gain from the fact that we've spent so much time on the post-Jim Crow 
assault, you know, trying to create a legal apparatus to address voter suppression and voter exclusion. To what extent are those uh, the right way of thinking about it or even cogent legal tools in this environment? And I'll open it up. Uh, uh, why don't we just go in order if we will, uh, Mirna? Okay, so I will say, Sam, that I'm stuck on your presumption. Like, I actually don't want to let the system off the hook. I think I think there might not be intentional uh, uh, suppression now, but I do think we have a system of voting that has been built upon a system that has excluded people. Yeah. And yeah. I think that there are people not prioritizing undoing that um, bad history that is baked into our system. So, like, I, while I think we can say that this actor or that actor may have not had that intent, at some point, we need to take an accounting for what we are not choosing to fix and what we are not prioritizing to fix. And so, what I what I will say is, we need to have better tools for what we call that kind of suppression, like a su call it suppression by neglect, call it suppression by lack of prioritization. And we need to hold people responsible for that. Um, and that may be jurisprudential changes of what the word intent means. That may be legislative acknowledgement of ways in which our system has baked in uh, systemic problems or existing inequalities. Um, what I think the upshot is, is we should be looking at outcomes. And the outcome that we want is one in which every eligible American is participating. And holding that as a standard and then looking at what is getting in the way of that and doing everything we can to, to remove those barriers. Okay, Bernard? Yeah, so, you know, I struggled as well trying to think of examples of policies, you know, like voter identification laws, hard to think about, you know, how that, you know, makes things better. Um, has some paradoxical kind of effect. But the one thing I did think of was voter registration. So we know that voter registration, you know, obviously was, you know, passed and introduced during the progressive era in an effort to, you know, reduce voting strength of minority groups, African-American voters in the South and immigrant voters in the North and Northeast. But, you know, now we can use voter registration and lists, putting aside for a second purges and the way in which those lists are maintained, uh, to discriminate perhaps issues of movers, such as what was just shown in Wisconsin recently, in a recent report, you know, the fact that we have a listing of, you know, of registered voters means that now states, if they choose to do so, and we hope that they do, can mail ballots, right, to all voters on the list, all the voters who have made the decision to register who are registered automatically. We also know that they could send applications, even in states like Georgia, where not every voter is going to be sent a ballot, you know, Every voter for the primary, very least, could get an absentee ballot, right? Get that mailed to them. So I think that there's opportunities there to think about, again, a practice that was used to discriminate. In this case, right, not even to mention how it's used by campaigns to mobilize, can actually be used to facilitate locating and finding voters and getting them the information they need to cast a ballot during the pandemic. So, so um, there's, a, there's some questions from the audience. Let me just feed them in uh, so you can take up whatever Sorry. you like. Um, there's a question about uh, federal authority in this. And since so much of the disability area comes from federal law, I'm wondering what are the bounds of federal authority? Can the president send in troops? You know, th those kinds of questions. Any thoughts on that? Rabia? Well, I don't know if the president sending troops to the polls is really a disability issue. I mean, I think no, it's not. But it's a it's a federalism type concern about where do you see the impetus for positive change here? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, I think uh, as an answer to the previous question. Um, so one thing the disability community has been thinking about a lot, um, and not just for this election, is the dispersal of elections and voting outside of uh, polling places on mm -hmm. election day. So this is a community that has been using mail-in voting for a long time um, and thinking about accessibility for mail-in voting, thinking about portable poll workers, poll workers going to places where voters are. So we can pick up on the good work that 
um, folks like Alice Wong at the Disability Visibility Project, Rebecca po Coakley, who's the director of the Disability Justice Initiative, the Center for American Progress, or the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, have been doing in this space um, so that we don't have to start from scratch. Um, in terms of voter intimidation at the polls, I mean, I think that that is something that we're all going to be joining forces to try to um, prevent. Okay. Um, the, the short answer is that the, the president can't. He doesn't have authority to send federal troops in to federal election, uh, to deal with elections. It is uh, against the law. Uh, but, uh, you know, that what we do need to do is to uh, account for other ways in which non-voters uh, non may be being disrupted um, and, uh, and just predict, plan, troubleshoot in advance, tell everybody we've got it when we've got it figured out. Yeah, I think that, uh, that the president's authority here is not the lawful one of sending in the troops, but providing the backdrop for claims that the elections have failed and attempts by state legislators or local election officials to stop the balloting process, which includes the handling, the, uh, the tallying of absentee votes. And there are uh, ominous signs out there from the uh, claim in the Pennsylvania uh, cert petition uh, uh, by the uh, state Republicans that the elections clause prohibits the state courts from overseeing the administration of the elections. There's been talk in, also in Pennsylvania of invoking the Article II powers of the, uh, of the legislature to set the terms of the electors to override mm -hmm. the election process. Um, it's not the, f the federal troops as such, it's what you've all referred to as the breakdown of norms about how you handle an election. And that's really the, the, the hard question right now is that there is, as Stacey Abrams uh, laid out, there's a sense of you got to tell people this is really impressive what we're doing right now and how well most states have responded, while at the same time realizing that there's so much legal uncertainty on issues that we've never confronted. Bernard, I see you shaking vigorously here. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm agreeing with that, but you know, as was mentioned, as Mirna said, I mean, we can't just depend on the courts, right? We can't just depend on the legal system and there's norms that exist, but as we saw in the wake of, for example, the Supreme Court nomination, which is going to happen, right? If the rules don't specifically prohibit it, especially in terms of elections, you know, there's a fear that you'll have a substantial share of the country, including, you know, the people who back the party that's in charge of the Senate right now, right, that say, you know, this is fair game. It's fair game for Pennsylvania, for example, as you mentioned, to say, you know, well, we don't think the results were legitimate in some way. So we're going to have, you know, we're going to say that that election was not run. And I mean, it's complicated legally, but in a, in a fair manner, that means that that's the will of the people and therefore going to put up a slate of electors. So I, I think that there's, you know, Again, I'm worried about the terms that we're setting where we're, we're defining things very clearly as like, yes, permitted, not permitted, when the bottom line is like, it will happen, or if it happens, then we're gonna have to deal with the consequences, which could be the complete dissolution of, I think, many of the structures we take it for granted in our democracy, just because they're not codified. All right, if I, if I could add my, uh, my nightmare scenario, what keeps me up at night and, it is, uh, it is not so much the election administration, which is gonna be disastrous and it's gonna be very difficult, but I actually think that most election administrators and most of the state's uh, apparatuses, you know, they, they're challenged uh, by the events. I think mostly they act in good faith. And I thought that, mm -hmm. for example, the, uh, the Wisconsin primary, there was a lot of attention paid in a very highly partisan environment to the lines in Milwaukee. But Wisconsin went from handling about 120,000 absentee ballots in a normal cycle to handling 1.2 million and did so reasonably well. It was an impressive administrative effort. What keeps me up is the place where it all breaks down. 
And Article II of the Constitution and the power to the independent state legislature doctrine recognized in McPherson uh, in the 19th century, recognized again in, in Bush v. Palm Beach County in the, in the 20th mm -hmm. century. That's a terrible event because that can be an attack on the entire system and the legitimacy of the transfer of power, rotation in office. We've not had an election where the very fundamentals of democracy are seem to be at stake and lurking in the background. And and we don't I, I agree that litigation may not be the answer. This could very well end up in the Congress. But this is an explosive circumstance for America. That's uh, that's my nightmare concern that the pandemic has simply compounded the circumstances in which there can be an assault that uh, elections have failed. Uh, anybody want to tell me that I'm wrong and that I shouldn't stay up at night worrying about this stuff? Myrna, you're muted. Uh, uh, I think I'm not now. Um, I, uh, and I'm very rarely muted. <laughs> so uh, maybe it's good for me once in a while. Um, I think the, I think that's a different articulation of the concerns that I had, which is one that people are over relying on uh, a branch of government to save us when what we need to be doing is making sure that people in the idea of a broad and robust and participatory democracy, and they push back on politicians who are trying to offer a different vision. Um, and two, what happens when people are exploiting the gaps as a means of political hardball? That's that's what I mean when I say political hardball. Um, and I and my hope is that we learn from this experience and and make it a point of constantly, constantly, constantly committing ourselves to. Uh, elections as a peaceable way of resolving our political differences, that we are constantly committing ourselves to a broad and robust and participatory and inclusive democracy, and that we are constantly committing ourselves to the idea of free, fair, and accessible elections. And that means not something that we do every four years, but something we do all the time, that we do when we're talking about the legislation we pass, when we're talking about who we elect, when we're talking about like what sort of curriculum we wanna be teaching our kids in school. Um, because I think this, um, especially as the country continues to change with broad um, demographic changes happening, um, there's going to be folks who have anxiousness about what the changes mean for them and are gonna try and hold on to the power that they have. And so I, I think that that means really using this horribly difficult and challenging experience to figure out where have we gotten a bit soft on, where we've gotten a bit fuzzy on, and what do we need to do um, to make sure that we are all committed and invested to this idea of democracy. Well, yeah, let me we ask, go ahead, Robbie. I think we can take it back to Stacey Abrams' keynote speech. We've been here before. Voting has been a place in which we've seen dirty tricks. We've also seen death. We've seen people who have been sort of fought and died for the right to vote. And that, and it happens because it's important and it's a centerpiece in our democracy. So if we think about if there's any particular type of failure, then that's a point that we need to do some type of remedy to get everyone on the same page. So it could be a reminder of the fact that we need to bring everyone into, into our participatory democracy and everyone's not there yet. So let me take that point because we're running out of time to ask one last question. Um, and we'll go back, let me start with you, Rabia, and we'll go back through uh, the three of you. Um, if you had one reform that you could just implement, no politics, no, you, somebody gave you a card that said, you're it, you're, you're the czar for today, um, uh, and you can change one thing where what would your card be what what, what kind of uh structural it won't ha handle everything but give me an idea of where you think the the key reform has to be oh goodness um so i don't know how to the extent of my powers here but <laughs> i think that they're... they are a as ample as you want so i think some vindication of the idea with the american uh 
the Disabilities Act, we're having a private and independent vote. Um, so having uh, no excuses needed for balloting and then also um, providing mechanisms for accessibility. Okay, Bernard. Sure, so in the context of the pandemic, universal vote by mail. In outside of the pandemic, just in the real world, right? Portable and automatic voter registration. Okay, and Myrna? Um, I would end felony disenfranchisement for people living and working in the community. I think um, saying that there are some of us that are second class citizens and some of us that shouldn't be voting, I think um, injures all of us in ways that are palpable and ways that are not as palpable. And I think it interferes with the idea of some very important American values like inclusiveness, redemption, forgiveness, second chances. Well, since Dale's not here, I'll, I'll uh, give mine and claim it was Dale's, but it's not. Um, uh, my thought has been that the, that the biggest failing in American democracy is that we don't have independent uh, uh, election administration. Mm -hmm. And when the Venice Commission, which is a, uh, a, an organ of the uh, European, uh, uh, European Union indirectly, um, when it advises new democracies, the first thing it says is election administration, which goes from everything from redistricting to uh, registration and so forth, has to be independent of the powers that be. And Stacey Abrams began us by describing her gubernatorial campaign and running against the Secretary of State who was controlling the, the apparatus of voting on his own campaign to be governor. Now, at some point he recused from that. It seems to me that so many of our problems, not all by any means, but so many follow from the part insertion of partisan politics into the very fact of how we vote. And it, I, I, as a normative principle, if we were starting from scratch anywhere, it, that just seems intolerable to me. So I don't, the, the odd thing about being on camera is uh, I don't know if anybody's watching. It could be just the four of us. Uh, I don't know. Nobody's in the back of the room yelling at me is when we're supposed to stop. I was given a hard stop at 115, but I don't know. Maybe we can just keep going. But uh, if somebody could whisper in my ear as to what they want me to do, and if not, um, I am supposed to say that... Um, uh, this is brought to you by the uh, by many groups, but uh, one of them that's super active here, and I used to be on the board of it, is the Brennan Center, and they encourage me to relate to some public service. So public service, it's not just voting, it's being counted. And so fill out your census form if you haven't done so, and please register to vote, find out how to vote, Vote early if you can. Try to take the stress off the system. Um, and thank you all very much for joining us.